Doing enough. Hi, good morning, everybody. My name is Jomo Stewart. Uh, welcome to the Energy for All Alaska Task Force meeting of Tuesday. I believe it's the 10th, September 10th. Excellent. Okay, since I see a whole lot of new faces, I'll just make a very brief statement regarding the task force itself. So again, the Energy for All Alaska Task Force is actually a very long-running task force uh, facilitated and hosted by Fairbanks Economic Development Corporation. It's been going on for over 10 years. It actually started as the Cost of Energy Task Force back in the 2006-7-8 time frame uh, when the cost of energy spiked. A large, uh, broad cross-section of the community came together to see if we could work to try to address those issues and advocated for a whole number of things um, that actually uh, got advanced in on statewide public policy. Uh, of course, there was some conventional energy, uh, some oil and gas, particularly natural gas. The LNG trucking project was one of the things they chose to endorse. Uh, that's moving forward with that giant tank being built right now. So everybody know that you'll be able to apply for gas. It'll be a first come, first serve, and they should have it available for you next spring. Ain't that great? Good, it's working. Uh, let's see, other things that got uh, advocated for by the task force, of course, energy efficiency um, and energy retrofits uh, was the highest uh, endorsed uh, item. Of course, the cheapest BTU is the one you never use. Uh, that actually got picked up by the state. If you remember the energy retrofit program, uh, the largest driver initially came right out of our town right here in Fairbanks, along with a number of other things. Again, uh, windmills, solar panels, uh, large scale hydro facilities. Again, another look at the Sioux City business. I know that that can be a little controversial. They're going to lose hydro. And once it gets going, it's flat price power for you know, over 100 years. <laughs> The uh, task force has evolved, and now it's the Energy for All Alaska task force, trying to figure out how uh, to bring affordable energy, uh, hopefully uh, less uh, with less negative uh, externalities uh, to all the people of Alaska uh, for all of our benefit. Today we have as our guest, we have Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. Oh, here we go. Dr. Catherine Hayhoe uh, is an atmospheric scientist who, uh, whose research focuses on developing and applying high resolution climate projections to understand the what climate changes mean for the people or for people and the natural environment. She's professor and director of climate science center at Texas Tech University, has a BS in physics from the University of Toronto and MS and PhD in atmospheric science from the University of Illinois. Uh, Catherine has served as the lead author for the second, third, and fourth U.S. national climate assessments. She's a big deal, y'all. I didn't realize. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> She has also received the National Center for Science uh, Education's Friend of the Planet Award, the American Geophysical Union's Climate Communications Prize, the Sierra Club's Distinguished Service Award, and the Stephen H. Schneider Climate Communication Award. In her free time, like she has very much, Dr. Hayhoe also hosts and produces the PBS digital service uh, Global Weirding and serves on advisory committee for, the board, uh, for a broad range of organizations, including the Smithsonian Natural History Museum, the Earth Science Women's Network, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science Board. Okay, and finally, uh, she has uh, been named on a number of lists, including Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People, Foreign Policy's 100 Leading Thinkers, and Fortune Magazine's World's Greatest Leaders. So if I may, without further ado, introduce to you Dr. Catherine Mayo. Um, is this okay? Yes, you just have to hold it really close. But you can hear me in the back now, right? Yes, all right. So I'm speaking tonight at seven o'clock at uh, the Presbyterian Church. Everybody is welcome. Sorry, Friends, Friends Church. I apologize. Friends Church. The Presbyterian Church actually had it on the time. That was why I got confused. Um, at the Friends Church. But uh, today I'm speaking to you about a topic that they specifically asked me to talk about. So I am a climate scientist, I'm not an economist, uh, but I live in Texas and Texas has many similarities to Alaska. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to offer a few thoughts on energy, on Texas, on Alaska, on the similarities between us and give a couple of examples of things that are happening in Texas that you might not be aware of. Starting first of all with energy though, I wanna focus on how important energy is to our lives and our society. And that's really what this task force is about. If you look at world population, world population increased slowly over the last few thousand years until when? Until just the last few hundred years. If you look at average life expectancy in the UK where they've been keeping track of it for a pretty long time, I know this is a little far away, so I'll try to read you the axes. From the 1700s until now, the average life expectancy at birth has doubled from 40 to 80 years. 
people are living twice as long now. And the main reason that people are living twice as long is energy. The industrial revolution was when we figured out how to replace human and animal labor with originally coal, and then later on, natural gas and oil. Just imagine for a minute what your life would be like, and actually some of you may have this life, and you probably know someone who does, what your life is like without refrigeration, what your life is like without electricity and light, what's your life like without transportation? There'd be a lot less people in the room. And what would your life be like without the medical advances that came with the Industrial Revolution? I'm very sure that I would be dead at this point, especially given that I'm past 40. When you think about energy too, what we often don't realize is energy replaced significant labor. Significant labor by animal, significant labor by woman. A woman's life was an endless round of drudgery. Doing the laundry took a full day, and that was back when people only owned two sets of clothes anyways. It replaced a significant amount of child labor, and it was played a key role in replacing slave labor. The fact that the North was industrialized based on fossil fuels, whereas the South was not, played a key role in the Civil War. So when we think of energy, we have to be grateful for what it has brought us, and we have to recognize that we still need energy in the future because it is essential to the quality of our lives. When you look at energy around the world, this is a map showing production, um, in 2018, a country that has a number above 100% exports more than they use. So they produce more than they use, they can export. A number right around 100% is perfectly balanced between use and production. And then a number that is less than that is a net importer of energy. So this kind of shows you where the energy sources are around the world. In Texas, Texas is number one in the country in oil production, but if you actually calculate oil production per capita, it comes out almost the same as Alaska. If you look at natural gas, Texas is also number one, and if you look at per capita values, they're actually pretty similar. So the first thing that Texas and Alaska have in common is that they produce a lot of the energy that we use in modern society to power our civilization today. That is a major thing that we have in common. Now, when you burn coal and gas and oil, it produces heat trapping gases. And so we know that Texas as a whole is the number one producer of carbon emissions in the country. California looks the same color here, but if you actually look at the numbers, Texas edges ahead of California. But then if you divide this by the number of people, Alaska is right up there. In fact, Alaska is higher than Texas. And a great deal of that is because there's a lot more energy needs for heating and for transportation over longer distances. So what else do we have in common? The second thing we have in common is the fact that we are both top carbon emitters. Why does emitting carbon matter? It's because we've known since the 1850s, 1850s, not 1950s, We've known since the 1850s that when we dig up and burn coal, originally that was what they were studying in the 1850s, but then oil and gas later, it produces carbon dioxide, which is a heat trapping gas. Why does it matter? It matters because, let me show you a video that explains it in 60 seconds. Let's see if I can make this play. Here we go. So carbon dioxide matters because our planet, there's our happy planet, our planet has a natural blanket of heat trapping gases already. The sun's energy shines down and goes right through this blanket pretty much like a window. And then the earth absorbs the sun's energy and heats up and gives off heat energy. And the blanket traps that heat energy just like the blanket traps our body heat on a cold night. That blanket is what keeps our planet habitable for life. We would be almost 60 degrees Fahrenheit colder, a frozen ball of ice, if we did not have this amazing natural blanket. So if this is a natural blanket that's responsible for life, what's the problem? The problem is by digging up and burning coal and gas and oil, we're wrapping an extra blanket around the planet that it does not need. And just like when I used to go stay at my grandma's and she would sneak in every night and put an extra blanket on me, we had central heating and I would wake up sweating saying, Grandma, I don't need this blanket. In the same way, we're wrapping an extra blanket around our planet and that is why it's running a fever. 
So that's why carbon matters. What else do we have in common though? Well, wherever we go in the world, we know that there's normal conditions. We have cold days and hot days. We have wet days and dry days. If you live in Texas, you know that our variability looks more like this. But you know what? If you live in Alaska, it looks like this too. We have much more variability than the average place. And in fact, five years ago, I don't know if you remember, the Weather Channel had a competition for the toughest weather city in America. Do you remember this, anybody? Fairbanks went head to head with Fargo, Caribou, Maine, and I don't know if you can see the purple in the lower corner, Lubbock, Texas, where I live. Yes, see we have so much in common. <laughs> So Fairbanks and, uh, and Lubbock went head to head, and guess what? Lubbock won. Right. <laughs> yes, I think it was the dust storm that year that pushed it over the edge. It was one of those dust storms so big they called them kazoos. But don't worry, because the same year the Realtors Association also had a competition, and Lubbock won that competition too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure Fairbanks was not in the running for that competition. <laughs> so don't feel bad. I think that you didn't win the one that matters. <laughs> so what do we have in Texas? In Texas, we have floods. And in Alaska, you have floods too. In Texas, we have hurricanes, which are tropical cyclones. And in Alaska, you have cyclones and storms too. In Texas, we have droughts and water shortages, and you are in a drought right now with water shortages. Texas has record-breaking wildfires. You might not hear about them, but they have them. They have a lot of grass and a lot of juniper shrub, and it burns. Well, obviously, you have wildfires, too. Last year in Texas, in August, 78% of the state, almost 80% of the state was in drought. And by October, Central Texas experienced the wettest fall on record. It changes so fast, you get whiplash. And that is exactly what's happened here this year. We were just in Denali where one of the ecologists was telling us about how it was a record dry summer and then they got the most precipitation in 30 days that they'd ever measured at the park. So the third thing that we have in common is that we experience a naturally, totally naturally, naturally extremely variable climate. But, what's the but? We already naturally are impacted by weather and climate disasters. This is a map from NOAA, not NOAA's ARC, but NOAA. Uh, showing the number of billion dollar weather and climate disasters that each state has experienced. And the reason why Texas is so dark red is because what's the units here? The units is number of billion dollar events. Texas has a lot of infrastructure, has a lot of people. If, if you basically divide this by per capita, I'm pretty sure Alaska would be dark red right up by Texas. It's just a function of how much stuff you have to be damaged. What's the number one reason why we care about a changing climate? The number one reason why we humans care today is because a changing climate is loading the weather dice against us. It is taking the natural risks. So you always have a chance of rolling a double six. What's a double six? Record breaking heat wave, a prolonged drought, a crazy strong storm. These happen naturally. If you live in Lubbock and if you live in Fairbanks, you already have three sixes on your dice, naturally. But as climate changes, wherever we live, the risks that we already face naturally are increasing. Decade by decade, as the planet warms, it's like it, to anthropomorphize it a little bit, it's like it's sneaking in and taking one of those numbers off our dice and turning it into another six and then another six, and then all of a sudden Houston experiences three 500 year flood events in three years. That's not a 500 year flood event anymore. And then all of a sudden you roll a double seven, you're like, where did the wildfire season come from? We've never seen something like this before. That's how climate change is affecting us. It's affecting us by taking our natural variability, by creating long-term trends in that variability, 
towards warmer conditions and also, watch carefully, more variable conditions as well. We know, and I talked about this more last night, we know, for example, that heat waves are getting more frequent, cold waves less frequent. Droughts are getting stronger, forest fires are burning greater area. We also know that warmer air holds more water vapor, so heavy rainfall is becoming more intense and more frequent. We humans care about a changing climate because it takes our natural risks that we already face naturally in the places where we live, and it exacerbates or amplifies them, making them worse. So I added on a little bit to reason number three here. We don't only have a very extremely variable climate naturally, but that makes us even more vulnerable to the impact of a changing climate. Because if it's loading the dice against us, we already have three sixes on our dice, we are on the front lines of experiencing the impact of a changing climate. What else do we have in common? Well, if you went to my talk last night, if you didn't, don't worry. But if you did go to my talk last night, you know that I showed a series of maps from the Yale Climate Opinion Survey. So these maps go by county and they show people's responses to the question at the top. Here, the question is, do you think global warming is happening? Anything that is blue is less than 50% of people said yes. Anything that is orange is greater than 50%. So do you think it's happening? People pretty much agree Alaska is pretty dark orange, right? Do you think it will harm plants and animals? Yes. Now the interesting thing is if you notice there's a county in Utah there that's slight blue, you see that? So apparently they don't think it's happening, but it will harm plants and animals. <laughs> A little bit of a disconnect there. <laughs> Do you think it will harm future generations? Everybody says pretty much yes. Okay, so plants and animals, future generations. Do you think it will harm people in developing countries who live far away from us? Well, there's a little bit more blue there, but overall still overwhelmingly orange, right? Do you think it will harm people in the United States? We're getting a bit more blue here, but you'll notice Alaska down there is still quite orange. So we think by and large, it's real. It's affecting plants and animals, future generations, developing countries and other people in the United States. And then they ask this question, do you think it will harm you? Is that not stunning? I mean, look at Alaska. Less than 50% of people think they're personally affected. Not even today, they said, you know, in 15 years, will it affect you? So this is where the disconnect is. And let me zoom in on Alaska here so you can actually see. See, there you can, there you can actually see it. Look at Fairbanks. It's pretty dark blue compared to some of the surrounding area. So what else do Texas and Alaska have in common? We know climate is changing, but we don't think it matters to us. Somehow, miraculously, it affects our neighbors, but not us. And why is that? It's because one of the most important and obvious and visible symbols of a changing climate is an animal. It's not a human. Or if we do have a human face on this, it's the face of humans who live very far away from us. So as I talked about last night, I'm very convinced that the most dangerous myth we've bought into is that this thing doesn't matter to us. But here's the thing. If you've been eating in a very unhealthy way and living a very unhealthy lifestyle that is damaging your heart, is the time to change your diet and your lifestyle when you are lying on the stretcher being loaded into the ambulance going to the hospital because you had a heart attack? Preferably not. Preferably the time is before. Like 10 years before when you visited the doctor and they said, you know, you really should take some serious action now or else you're going to be looking at some very dangerous consequences. That's the situation that we're in today. But there's another dangerous myth we bought into. And the second most dangerous myth is that there's nothing we can do to fix it except ruin the economy. Have you heard this myth? Yeah. If you haven't, talk to more people around Fairbanks or Texas. <laughs> and so this is where I want to offer some suggestions. First of all, in order to fix this, I'm not going to sugarcoat it, I'm a climate scientist. We have to wean ourselves off the types of energy we've been using for 300 years. There's really no way around that. But at the same time, we have to provide people with energy. And frankly, 
flipping the switch today and turning off fossil fuels would actually do more harm, especially short term. I mean, imagine all of a sudden living our lives with absolutely no energy because most places still wouldn't have energy. But we need to transition. And what I want to do is I want to offer some insight into what's happening in Texas. Again, I'm not an economist. I'm not an energy expert. But I'm going to tell you what's happening so that you know. In Texas, here's what's happening. There are almost 35,000 jobs now in the wind and solar energy industries. 19.2% of the power on our grid last year came from wind and then a little bit from solar, but the solar is growing fast. Fort Hood is the biggest, Fort Hood there in the upper right left-hand corner, Fort Hood is the biggest military base in the country. Two years ago, they signed a new contract to get their electricity from wind and solar because it was cheaper than natural gas. It will save U.S. taxpayers over $100 million. DFW is the first carbon neutral airport in, the, in North America. There are entire towns that are going 100% clean and green energy. In Texas, the American Wind Energy Association, that's what AWEA stands for, the American Wind Energy Association has a lot of the statistics on installed wind capacity under construction. You can see that there was 25,000 megawatts installed and another 5,000 under development. Um, share of energy production, economic benefits, cumulative wind project investment is $46 billion, annual state and local tax payments, 237 million annual land lease. So this is mostly going to farmers and ranchers who own the land. Annual land lease is over $70 million. I've talked to some of the producers who have wind turbines on their land and I asked them, I said, you know, why do you have wind turbines? Because you're certainly not on board with the idea that we have to reduce our carbon emissions. And they say, well, because the check arrives in the mail. It is becoming economically viable. And in fact, if you look across the whole country, this is an analysis by the University of Texas at Austin. They were looking at the levelized cost of electricity across the whole country at 2018 prices. And they were looking at which type of energy is currently cheapest. Sorry, electricity specifically. So the green there is wind. Wind is the cheapest. Now, now some people might say, or you might even be thinking, it's because of all those government subsidies. I won't ask for a show of hands, but you may be thinking that. Well, unfortunately, according to the International Monetary Fund, the subsidies on fossil fuels exceed the subsidies on renewable energy by about 50 to one. And the fossil fuel subsidies in the United States alone exceed the Pentagon's budget. So this is just looking at cost today. But here's the thing, if you took off the subsidies on everything, everything, solar, wind, fossil fuels, and everything, you'd be looking at a very different picture where that green and the purple, which is solar, the orange is natural gas. You see there's no coal anywhere on this map. Fairbanks, of course, is not on this map, but in the lower 48. If you took the subsidies off, the green and the pink would spread much faster across the country. In fact, if you put a price on carbon, which is a way to use the market to actually offset the subsidies. So if you put a price on carbon, you can see the picture changes substantially. So again, here it is current day. Here it is with a price of 50 tons, uh, $50 per ton. Now you might say, what is this price on carbon? The price on carbon is a bipartisan policy mechanism that is the subject of significant, uh, not only conversation in political circles these days, but actually as of this past year, proposed legislation. Why is this so attractive? It's because it has bipartisan support. It has the support of people like George Schultz and Jim Baker who served under the Bush administration. There are articles op eds in entire think tanks talking about conservative free market solutions to climate change and that's where prices on carbon come in. So again, if you, if you keep your ears tuned, you will hear discussions about putting a price on carbon and what that's gonna do is that's gonna change the electricity balance and the costs of where we get our energy from. So you might say, okay, well, that's very well for Texas. What about Alaska? Well, as you alluded to, and as this committee studies, 
you know that there is a lot going on in Alaska. In fact, I was floored when I started to do my research and look into it because I had the same stereotype as, some, as everybody else, thinking, oh, you know, Alaska, very windy, but maybe you can't run the turbines. Of course, you can't have solar in the winter. I was wrong, and a lot of people are wrong, because there is so much potential in Alaska. So this is the Renewable Energy Atlas of Alaska that was published four years ago now, right? And they have lots of very specific examples of things that are happening that are incredibly diverse. That was what I found when I looked at what happens in Alaska, the amazing diversity and ingenuity of the solutions. It frankly far surpasses what we have in Texas. In Texas, people like everything big, so they like a giant big wind farm or a giant big solar farm. But here in Alaska, the solutions are customized and they're very specific and they're very diverse, whether you're turning wind into heat, whether you're using biomass, whether there's a lot of hydroelectric. In the Atlas, they had a map of all of the projects back four years ago. So obviously this map would be more populated today, right? How many, um, do you have any sense on how many more projects there are today than there were five years or four years ago? Okay. But we just had one from the Wood Energy Group. Okay. So there's one from the Wood Energy Group. There's this one where they're, put, you're, they're actually using stream flow to generate electricity and replace some of their diesel use. There's all of these organizations and companies that are popping up all over. If you just Google you know, renewable energy in Alaska, you get all kinds of things from solar panels on the cabin to um, you know, village-sized wind turbines. And then, then of course, the REAP initiative, which you mentioned, has been very successful. If you look at what they accomplished since they began in, um, was it 2016? When, or when did it begin? Okay, 2016. Okay. Since they began, they have saved $110 million in efficiency and energy savings. As you said, the cheapest kilowatt is the one you don't use. They funded 60 projects, almost a billion dollars worth of clean energy state support, and they've educated 4,000 students too. What can happen in Alaska? Well, you all know this better than I do, but if you go looking for resources, there are resources of, from people who have done analysis that can help. So for example, the Solutions Project at Stanford University has gone through every single state, by state, and they look very specifically at, if you were going to get to 100% clean energy by 2050, what different types of sources would give you the cheapest way to do this? So Google Solutions Project, and it will take you to an analysis like this that actually shows, as you would expect, concentrating solar plants 0%. That's just not an effective way. Concentrating solar plants are the ones that are arranged in a circle and they've got oil in the middle or salt that are heated by it so they can give off power all night long. That's just not an option for here. It's an option for Arizona. On the other hand, though, if you want to talk about tidal turbines and hydroelectric, there's huge potential here. According to this analysis, at least, there's many different analyses, this is just one. But according to this analysis, the number of 40-year jobs, so not one-off jobs, but 40-year jobs created would be almost 15,000 in construction and 15,000 in operation, so 30,000, which is the amount that Texas has today. They estimate that there would be significant health cost savings, a reduction in 84 lives lost to air pollution each year, the total footprint would be 0.13%, so not 13%, but 0.13% of Alaska's land area. I actually calculated how much of Texas you'd need to supply the entire lower 48, and it's about 100 by 100 square miles. That's how much land you'd need in Texas, and trust me, that land exists. It's about the size of three Texas cotton farms. They also showed that this would ultimately reduce, not increase, but reduce energy costs from 15 cents per kilowatt hour to 11 per person they would save 483 dollars and the energy health and climate cost savings would be 27 thousand dollars per person some pretty stunning numbers again i'm not telling you trust what i tell you i'm telling you where this information comes from so you can go look at it yourself and see how they did the calculations whether it makes sense if there's some other estimates out there and look at what's happening in Alaska. But the bottom line is this. When we look at what's happening, here's the wind energy stats for Alaska. They look very different than Texas. When we look at what's happening, we see very clearly something that is really amazing. And that is that we have the potential to lead the US into the clean energy future. 
Texas has the potential to do it at a very large scale. Alaska has the potential to do it through its incredible diversity and ingenuity, which exceeds anything that I have seen anywhere else. So I wanna show you a couple more maps to conclude. These are, remember the, the maps we looked at? This is the map asking, do you support funding research into renewable energy? That's a very red map. Yeah, no, no, it's not. They didn't call governors particularly, they just called people. You can see Alaska down there. Do you support regulating carbon as a pollutant? Turns out people do. Here's Alaska. Do you support setting strict CO2 limits on existing coal-fired power plants? People pretty much do. Do you support taxing fossil fuel companies while equally reducing other taxes? So something like the carbon tax. People pretty much do. Do you support requiring utilities to produce at least 20% of their power from renewable sources? There's support for that too. So where do we stand now? As of 2014, four years ago, new installations of energy officially were more clean energy than fossil fuels. So the 50% mark was crossed in 2014, where new installations were more clean energy than fossil fuels. By 20, all renewables, including both traditional ones as well as modern ones, accounted for 18.2% of global energy consumption in all sectors. By 2017, renewables accounted for 70% of new power installations. So they were up from 50% to 70% in just three years, thanks primarily to costs dropping and that being the most effective way to get energy. By 2018, we were seeing that the cost of renewables was closing in, not just on coal, but on natural gas. So the idea that you have to ruin the economy is starting to flip on its side. For many places now, the way to ruin their economy is to continue to build new fossil fuel installations. And as of 2019, in California, for the first time, a new solar farm, including batteries, because I don't know if you've heard that the sun doesn't shine at night. <laughs> the number of people who tell me that would be would astonish you. <laughs> and I'm just like, really? Tell me more. <laughs> they also sometimes mention the wind doesn't blow all the time. And I'm like, indeed. <laughs> yes. So anyways. Solar with batteries is now cheaper than natural gas in California. And I just wanted to highlight the prices, the wholesale price. So this is not the customer price, but the wholesale price they're getting is two cents per kilowatt hour for the solar energy and 1.3 cents for the batteries. Is that stunning or what? So to sum it all up, one of my favorite articles I ran into is this article because it says, what rural Alaska can teach the world about renewable energy? And you know what this article said? It said that Alaska can teach the world that it is flexible, it is diverse, it is reliable, and it is cheap. That was what this article was about. So there's a lot that we have in common. And let's see where I am. The bottom line is we need energy. We need energy today more than ever. There's still a billion people in the world who live in energy poverty today. And lack of access to energy is directly correlated with poverty, with hunger, with uh, uh, very short more, um, lifetime rates. But today, telling people that, oh, you don't have energy, so you need more fossil fuels, it's like telling people, you need a party line telephone. You're not at the stage yet where you can really aspire to a smartphone. I mean, that's a very patronizing, colonialistic kind of attitude to have. And saying we need to invest more in fossil fuels now is like telling my great-grandmother, this is, is my great-grandmother, Lucy, it's like telling my great-grandmother we need to invest more in horses and buggies. Lucy got married that year, and six years later, this was the family portrait. So the world is changing. We still need energy. But what Texas and Alaska have in common, I think more than any other state, is that we have the potential to lead the world and show them how to get there. Thank you.
Oh, will you sit right through that? We have plenty of time for questions. All right. Mr. Prox, you're going to get a tough one right out of the sheet. Yeah, you, are, <laughs> you, you mentioned, I think you said that oil is subsidized 60 times more than renewables or gas. No, what I said was all fossil fuels. All fossil fuels. When you look at coal, oil, and gas all together, they're subsidized more than all renewables put together. And that information comes from the International Monetary Fund. They do an update on global subsidies and national subsidies every couple of years. So if you just Google IMF, you'll find that. And do they explain what they mean by subsidy? That isn't clear to me that it's not obvious to me. Yes. Yes, do they explain, they explain they in extreme detail. Okay. So it's really up to you how far you want to dig. But basically, there's so fossil fuel companies have been around for a really long time. So part of it is through, you know, direct rebate on taxes, on preferential treatment, on not having to pay on their revenues. Part of it is the public lands that they use. Part of it is the waste they leave behind. Um, part of it is the impact of pollution on the economy. One in six deaths around the world is directly related to pollution. Not all that pollution comes from fossil fuels, but a significant part of it. Okay. So they factor in the cost to society and the economy. And if you look up that report, it will give you all the details. Okay. So yeah. that's where I was wondering where, you, where they arrived at the, uh, I guess the total cost. Yes, okay. exactly. All right, in the back there. Yeah, there are a couple of points that I wanted to bring out. Uh, energy is a very important source uh, uh, for the benefit of the humanity. Uh, one of the problems I see is China mm -hmm. and India. I think they are the greatest polluters today. Uh, Russia has some problems too. And uh, uh, they're the ones that we need to try to work on. Now, of course, the U.S., you know, we have a higher standard of living and we uh, need, supposedly need all, all the innovations that we have now. Uh, the problem I, I have seen in, in Alaska, sure, we have pushed hard for renewable energy. Mm -hmm. uh, our fuel costs are very high compared to the lower 48. Yes. And unfortunately, uh, wind power has really not proved to be that good in mm -hmm. some areas right. because it's independent. Mm -hmm. And we do not have the technology of just switching over from wind to, um, um, you know, to uh, petroleum. Uh, regenerators and stuff like that. And uh, uh, also, uh, uh, is there a question there, Roger? Windmills. Yeah, sir, I'm sorry, is there a question? Uh, yeah, well, I have a question. Okay. How, how are we going to deal with these things? Right. As far as uh, renewable energy is something we need to work on here, but it's, it's not working very well so far, except in small communities. And the other thing is, is uh, what's going to happen as far as bringing in China and uh, Yes, in and India. So okay. So, so this is something that I would say I hear very frequently because we all have the image that was true 10 or 15 years ago of China building a coal-fired power plant today. That was what they were doing 10 or 15 years ago. We know what the air quality looks like over Beijing. We know when they hosted the Olympics, they had to shut down all the coal-fired power plants around Beijing so that athletes could actually compete and not be harmed by it. If any of us have been to any of these places, you know what that air feels like in your lungs. But what we don't often hear, and this is, I think, part of just the fact that our news is always biased towards negativity rather than positivity, what we don't hear is that China has actually already permanently shut down all of the coal plants around Beijing that they are now unfortunately exporting their coal to other countries because they lead the entire world in new wind and solar energy as well as hydroelectric installations. India is also investing very significantly. They have replaced all of the, the nationally owned light bulbs with LEDs <laughs> across the whole country. Um, they just announced that they're going to be going plastic free. I don't know how that's gonna happen, but that's the prime minister's goal. I just saw that today. 
Uh, it might have been a little bit to take pressure off the cashmere situation. We won't get into that. But at least they're making positive steps forward there. Um, so what many people don't realize is that, first of all, energy powers the economy. And China is currently beating the pants off the U.S. in the nuclear energy. And for anybody who cares about the economy, I think that needs to be a very serious concern. I mean, if the U.S. continues to invest in coal, when there's more jobs in solar energy across the lower 48 than in the entire coal industry, when the Museum of Coal Mining in Kentucky put solar panels on the roof, it's like the U.S. is investing in horses and buggies when we have cars and China is building the best cars in the world. I mean, the U.S. could seriously, this is not unconceivable, if it continues on its current pathway for another decade or more, the U.S. could end up as a second world country. I mean, that is, it would take a while to get there, but given what is happening in China and what is happening in India, that is a concern. So first of all, that's the first thing to be aware of. Yes, they still burn fossil fuels, absolutely, but they are moving faster in the other direction than us. The second thing to be aware of, as a climate scientist, I can tell you, is that climate responds to cumulative emissions, not annual emissions. So climate responds to the buildup of emissions over time because it all sits in the atmosphere. It's kind of like the buildup of, of cholesterol in your arteries. Um, it doesn't respond to the hamburger you ate today. It responds to all of the hamburgers you've eaten over the past 30 years. So when you look at cumulative emissions, the United States is at 29%. China is at about 12%. So there is a long way to go before China reaches the impact of the United States on climate. So when people, I'm sorry to say, people sometimes say, well, what about China as an excuse to sort of dodge responsibility? It's like, no, cumulative carbon is what matters and the U.S. is still double. And if you look at it per capita, you don't even want to see that number. So how do renewables work in Alaska? Well, of course you're more challenged because the weather is very extreme. Um, solar is unusable half of the year. Um, batteries are more challenged because they don't perform as well in cold weather. So California can easily get batteries to back up their, their um, wind turbines, but they're not as easy a solution here as they are in other places. Not impossible, but just not as easy. That's why the diversity is important. And I am not, again, an economist. I'm not an engineer or an energy expert. So I cannot tell you for sure, in my expert opinion, here's what works for Alaska. But what I can do is what I did, which is point you to resources like the Solutions Project, like the Renewable Energy Atlas that actually has a map of where to put wind and where not to put wind, for example, that you can use to actually inform these decisions. The, the experts are out there. UAS has a ton of us. They have a whole center that looks at renewable and clean energy. So is there anybody here from that center? Okay, but there's people here who know that. So the resources are here and to figure out how to do it, you have to just ask. Yes, what was your? I have a couple of comments. When you said the renewable energy atlas was updated, it just came out of the way to say the I googled the heck out of it. <laughs> <laughs> I could not find it. Um, well, you may have had it really? on that website before I got it. Um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> okay, good, good. And, um, I'm going to update it for Anchorage tomorrow. All right. <laughs> and, and what, what I think. Development, not the development plan. Oh, I yeah. still turn my oil. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, it, you know, last week I didn't go with them. Yep. Discovered. But um, you know, there's also because of much of Alaska is not a road system, and it's a series of micro mm -hmm. and so forth in the rail belt that it does support creativity. Mm -hmm. um, and who's left? Is it people that just is now? Um, Thing I want to mention is that batteries are not the only type of storage. Pumped storage can be very effective. So when the wind is blowing, you pump the water uphill. When it's not, you let it roll back downhill. You know what they're doing in Texas? They're using old oil wells and they're pumping water down, down underground and letting it back up again when the wind isn't blowing. So you can get really creative with storage. There's other things you can do besides batteries. And I think this really is the way of the future. I'm glad to mention microgrids because I think 
if it's still true, that Alaska leads the world in microgrids. 40% 40 40 of the world's microgrids are in Alaska, which is amazing. So, so there is potential, but, but let me just say this. I'm not saying it's gonna be easy because we've been using fossil fuels for 300 years. You can't just snap your fingers and transition overnight. It just doesn't work like that. I wish it did. If anybody figured out how to do that, let me know. But a big part of it is the driver of not only cost, but also the driver of security, of air quality, of independence and resilience. There's a lot of reasons to make this switch. And a lot of it has to do with ensuring the economic future of the state. Go back there. I'm wondering about the production of Yes. So she's wondering, I'm just repeating it for the audience online, wondering about the cost of producing the solar panels, the batteries, the wind turbines. So what you're asking about is called um, life cycle. And what engineers do when they design new turbines or wind farms is they actually calculate the life cycle emissions. So in other words, how long does this farm have to operate to offset the costs and the carbon emissions if they're produced not using renewable energy of, of producing these materials. And the answer with wind turbines, I believe, is currently around six months. Mm. Yeah. I'm not sure of the facts about, about solar, but if you Google life cycle emissions, it'll tell you when the break even point is. Um, the interesting thing, so uh, electric cars are getting to be a bigger thing in the lower 48 especially, and they have these batteries, right? So Tesla, at least, is taking back the batteries and recycling them when you, you know, when the car reaches the end of its lifetime. Um, a big issue, though, with us in Texas is recycling the wind turbine blades because we are already on third generation blades. Every time I drive south of where we live in Lubbock, I see new wind farm going up. And last time I was driving down, I saw them replacing the blades. So the blades are now twice as long as they used to be. It is a crazy thing. Like, you used to see like a really long uh, shaft and then smaller blades. Now the blades are almost all the way down to here and they go way up there and they rotate a lot slower, which means they're a lot safer for birds but they produce way more energy. So recycling those, I think, is our next biggest challenge. There are people who are very aware of it, who are working on it, but we have to get on the stick with that because we don't want to have a graveyard of um, you know, old used wind turbines and solar panels that we have to cope with. It's not nearly as bad as something like you know, nuclear waste, but it's still an issue. We don't want to create a new issue for ourselves. We want to think ahead. Yes. Uh, the question is, are there plants that make them in the U.S. or are we importing them from China? Well, unfortunately, there's still quite a bit of importation happening. Um, we have a National Wind Energy Center at our university, and they do testing for turbines all over the world. And some of them come from GE, so they're American-made, but a lot of them come from outside. And this is a big issue because when they're inventing new technology, which they're doing all the time, whether they're bigger blades, whether they're vibrating wind, wind turbines now, whether it's new solar, a lot of the manufacturing is coming from outside the country. And unfortunately, due to new regulations, producing solar is going to be less, like actually manufacturing it, is going to be less financially viable in the US because they're trying to shore up the coal industry instead. Uh, but but there, there definitely are companies, and this is one of my personal favorite stories. I told this one last night. Um, I, I always wanted solar panels, but you know, they're pretty expensive to install, and you have to figure out how long you're going to be in the house before you move. So I sort of mentally put that off as something, you know, maybe we'll do in a couple more years because prices keep dropping. So then around Christmas, I got, like the week before Christmas, I got this weird email saying that there had been an inquiry on my credit rating. I'm like, oh, that's not good. So I said to my husband, I think somebody's hacked my social security number. What are we going to do? He's like, oh, don't worry about it. And I'm like, don't worry about it. What are you talking about? He's like, well, I might know something about that. I'm like, what? What do you know about that? He's like, well, I can't tell you. And, you know, that's just like catnip to a cat. <laughs> so I had a long list of reasons why he might have asked for my social security number. But then it turns out the reason he asked was because he was getting up solar panels for Christmas without telling me. Um, there was a huge tax rebate. So it turns out that it's just going to take us about five years to pay them off, which is amazing. And I have a plug-in car, so that helps too. And long story short, these solar panels come from a company called Mission Solar in San Antonio. 
And why I love them is because when oil prices dropped last time a few years ago, in Texas, as in Alaska, I'm going to put this on my list, but this is something we have in common, there are a lot of people who lose well-paying jobs. People who are making six figures with a high school education are all of a sudden just thrown out of work. So from, from the oil workers in the Permian Basin who lost their jobs, Mission Solar deliberately took in out-of-work oil work tech workers, trained them how to do solar panel manufacturing, and now it is a thriving local company that we're Love it. Yes. Yeah, I love that, that note On, on that notion of just transition and how we might be doing that at a maybe even more institutional scale. Yes, I'm so glad you brought that up because that's something very near and dear to my heart. Um, there, the idea that people have worked hard all their lives to support their families, to invest in the local economy, and if their organization, as is happening with a lot of coal organizations in the US RDK, goes out of business, they just lose their livelihood. It devastates the entire town and the entire region. There is nothing. So when I was in Utah a couple of years ago, Utah is a big coal producer. Utah has a horrible air pollution problem. I mean, you understand you live in Fairbanks, but Utah is, Salt Lake City is just about as bad. So we had a great discussion with the Republican head of the Senate, actually, and with people in the city on what are we going to do for these very specific towns where all of the industry depends on coal mining? And they specifically said, and I agreed with them, we cannot shut down the coal mine until we have attracted something else. It could be clean energy, it could be something else, but we need a commitment from a big enough corporation to build a plant there in that town. We need a commitment from them to hire and retrain, and we as the state can assist with this, any worker who wants a job guaranteed in the new facility. And when that is actually underway, being built, and the training is ready to happen, that is when we can shut down the coal mine. And I said, absolutely, because why should entire towns suffer? Again, that's sort of like pulling the plug immediately, but at, at the micro scale. So there's an organization in Canada that I love called ironplusearth.org. And they're all about, they're actually led organically by young professionals from within the energy industry, looking at a just transition and looking at retraining people to employ their job skills in clean energy. So Iron Plus Earth is just amazing. I love what they do. And just to, just to finish up with something that relates to the previous question, this is already happening in the US, but it isn't happening because of the federal government. In Wyoming, a Chinese company went into Wyoming and deliberately recruited coal miners to be retrained to do wind energy installations for a Chinese company. Why is it a Chinese company doing that? Why isn't it happening in the US? So it's really interesting that it isn't only happening because of issues of it's the fair and the right thing to do. The Chinese company probably couldn't, you know, couldn't care less about that. They're doing it because it's economic. They know they have hard, hardworking, skilled workers that need a job and they can use them. So that needs to be taken into account across the US. Not fake. No. Yes. <coughs> if I can get my voice working here, Joel. Something has kind of bothered me for years. And it's the fact that there is evidence to show that climate change uh, is related to uh, the Earth's uh, uh, elliptical uh, journey around the sun, the angle of the axis to the sun, undersea volcanism, uh, rotation of the sun, all these things. Why are they never, never mentioned in all the climate change symposiums that I've been to that have never been uh, mentioned, let alone quantified? Okay, well, um, I'm sorry, but that's actually false. 
They are very well quantified, and if you come to my talk tonight at 7 p.m., I'll be talking about them. But let me give you the short version. So climate, the Earth's climate varies for multiple reasons. It varies because of changes in the eccentricity and the precession and the tilt of the Earth's axis around the sun. These are called Milankovic cycles. They were discovered by a Serbian engineer during World War I, and there's a really interesting story. I'll be talking about that tonight. According to Milankovic cycles, or orbital cycles, which drive the ice ages and the warm periods in between, we should be now heading into the next ice age. Sometime in the next 1,500 years, and it's been calculated precisely, and I can show you the peer-reviewed literature that calculates that. According to volcanic emissions, they produce a tiny fraction of the CO2 and methane that humans produce, but when they erupt, they produce particles and soot that actually block the sun's energy like our umbrella and they cool the planet. According to natural cycles like El Nino, all they do is move heat around the Earth's system. They can't cause it to increase. That would be violating conservation of energy. The amount of heat coming from the Earth's core through the crust is only a tiny, tiny fraction, not enough to cause the warming that we see today. And the energy from the sun has actually been going down the last 40 years, not up. So we look at every single one of those causes. And the thing is, why you probably don't hear about them so much today is because we quantified them decades ago. If you went to a symposium 80 years ago, you would hear people talking about those things because that was when they were working on them. But now we've moved past that and we know that according to every natural factor right now, if you put them all together, we should be cooling, not warming. And so that's why humans are not responsible for all of the observed warming. Humans are actually responsible for more than the observed warming because we should actually be cooling. If you want more resources, I'm happy to provide them to you because they definitely exist. Good answer, thank you. Thank you so much, appreciate it. Now, how much more time do we have? I'm gonna do as much as you like, ma'am. Oh, okay. Well, I have to go talk some science. So we're gonna do, we're gonna do three, oh, you're waving at us to? No, I'm just gonna ask a oh, question. Okay, we're gonna do one sentence each from the four of you, one sentence each with a question mark at the end. <laughs> And then I'm going to do my best to answer them quick, and then I got to go run talk some science. So start over here with you. <laughs> what percent of the current climate change is due to CO2? Oh, percent that's due to CO2 emissions. Good question. Next. What are your thoughts on Nash's graph of the pollution? Okay, I've written two papers on that. Good question. Natural yeah, gas is a person. Yeah. Wind turbines. You could explain a little bit more about those. Oh, yeah, very cool. Okay, and last question. I was surprised at your comment that China is shutting down power plants. I just did a web search. It's there, article after article, they shut down around Beijing. Oh, okay. surprised. Awesome. Thank you. Validation. <laughs> That's fantastic. Okay, um, CO2 is responsible for about 65% of the warning, methane is responsible for about 18 to 20% of the warning, and then there's N2O and a bunch of what we call high global warming potential gases, the ones that came out of our spray cans back in the ozone hole days, that are responsible for a little bit of the rest. Yes. We don't, we don't count the volcano part in it. We measure the volcanic part, and it's a tiny fraction of what humans produce. Well, see, most of Earth's history was CO2 concentration in the atmosphere was much more serious than that. Okay. It's only one. There's only two other times in our okay, history sorry. that we had. Just a second. Just a second here. We, we have to go quickly. Um, today, CO2 levels should be dropping. They go up and down. And today, you can actually measure, if you know about it, you know that we can measure isotopic signatures, right? We can measure the isotopic signatures so we know exactly how much is coming from fossil fuels, and that's why we know the human contribution. All right. Um, the next question was uh, natural gas is a bridge fuel. Natural gas is much more efficient than coal. You get a lot more energy out of it. It's a lot cleaner, a lot less air pollution. So if your only choice is between coal and natural gas, you would definitely go with natural gas. And that's what the lower 48 has already been doing for the last 10 years. US emissions stabilized, even dropped a little bit, but then actually shot up the last year. But the reason why over the last 10 years, US emissions have not been going so fast is because the fracking boom replaced and drove out of business the coal. Coal was not driven out of business by renewables or by any policy. It was because fracking got cheaper. That's why. So in the US, in the lower 48, the bridge fuel has already happened. And we are about two steps from the end of the bridge because now across the southwest US from Texas to California, wind and solar and all the way up to the middle of the country are cheaper than natural gas. 
So the bridge has already, we've reached the end of the bridge for about a third of the lower 48 already, which is really amazing. Um, but that it is a bridge and it does help. Uh, vibrating wind turbines are really cool. You have to Google those to actually see the video. But they're these cones that go really high, and rather than rotating, they just vibrate and they produce energy through vibration. Now, they're not cost effective yet, they're still experimental. But I love reading about the new tech because I just think it's so cool. It's like, what are people going to think of next? There's already solar paint. Did you know you can paint your house with solar paint? Yes, I know. It's just crazy. There's solar fabric. A lot of it developed by DOD. DOD funds a lot of this research because they are very dependent on um, oil and gas for their operations. And I actually want to just leave you with one thing here. I want to leave you with um, a new website that was just produced that I think is pretty cool that you probably have not seen. And it is, let me just find it here. Um, it is called newclimatevoices.org. So let me see if I can go there. Newclimatevoices.org. And why I like this is because it's short videos from voices that you would not expect conservative voices talking about climate change. We have a former Republican congressman talking about a price on carbon. We have, I love his face. <laughs> we have an Air Force general telling people what's what and why the Air Force wants renewable energy because of security reasons. We have a libertarian, here's a libertarian, telling us about how he didn't used to think climate change is real, but he started looking into it and he realized that as a libertarian, he had to have the integrity to say, this violates my, my values. These people are infringing on my personal liberties. And then they got me to do it too. I, full disclosure, I am not American, so I'm not conservative or Republican or Democrat, but they got me because I am a Christian and a pastor's wife. And so I told people what I know as a scientist and what I believe as a person of faith. So if you're interested, please check out New Climate Voices. Each uh, video is just a couple of minutes long. They've got a little blurb on what they say and they've got more resources that you can go to to learn about that person. So please check it out and share. Thank you. All right. No, actually, before, before everybody gets up, again, thank you very much, Dr. Hale. Okay. Very much appreciate it. Thank you all for coming. Uh, just so you know, we do this almost every Tuesday. Of course, we usually do it over at the Fairbanks Economic Development Corporation offices. They're at, what, uh, 330 Wendell Street, Wendell Avenue, uh, uh, Hotner Law Office building right behind the courthouse. Okay, so you're always all welcome. I'll find more chairs. Now, you, could you say yes, something? I would love to. All right, do you guys mind if I just take one picture? Why don't I stand up and wait? Jim, Jim Dawson is out of town. <laughs> so I need to let him know we did have a meeting. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. One last thing. If anybody wants to hear Catherine tonight, oh, we'll be you. singing at Friends you Church at 